Thank you all for joining us today for the second session of forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data. Today we'll be, we will be discussing land cover classification. My name is Amber McCullum, and I will be your presenter alongside Erica Potis, who will be walking you through the exercise. We also have Erica and Juan Torres Perez presenting the Spanish session as well. Sean McCartney helped us create and edit the, the series. For this training, we will have four two-hour sessions. We had our first session on Tuesday, May 12th, and we will have sessions three and four on May 19th and 21st next week. We are presenting the same content in two different live sessions in both English and Spanish. Note that you only need to attend one session per day, and you can find all the course materials on the website listed here. After each session, we will have a question and answer portion. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box along the way, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. If we don't get to a question, you can also email myself or my colleagues, Erica and Juan, at our email addresses listed here. We will have one follow-on homework that will be available on the course website. This will cover content from the lecture, as well as from exercises on Google Earth Engine, which we um, are highlighting throughout this training. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline, which is Thursday, June 4th, so two weeks from the last session. The link to the homework will be available during the final session on May 21st. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. The two course prerequisites are the Introduction to Synthetic Aperture Radar webinar and the advanced webinar, SAR for Land Cover Applications. And you can see the link to both of those here. As usual, you can find all the course materials for this training on the website. And this includes a PDF of the presentation in both English and Spanish, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and eventually the link to the homework. Here's a general overview of the course. On Tuesday, we reviewed time series analysis with SAR data. Today, we will discuss land cover classification, and next week, we will discuss mangrove mapping and calculating forest stand height. We hope that by the end of the session, you will be able to identify the unique attributes of radar and optical data, explain the benefits and limitations to radar and optical data for forest mapping, Understand the basics of land cover classification using both radar and optical data. And finally, the ability to conduct a land cover classification using Landsat and Sentinel-1 data in Google Earth Engine. And this will be our exercise portion for today. Since we'll be conducting a land cover classification using both optical and radar data, let's start with a brief review of optical data. Every surface on Earth reflects and absorbs energy in a different manner. For optical imagery, the sensors are capturing similar data that we can see with our eyes in the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and some portions we cannot see in the infrared. So each object on the ground produces a unique signature of the amount of reflection or absorption of each wavelength. We call this the spectral signature. For example, vegetation, when it's green and healthy, absorbs blue and red and green and infrared. So this is why we see plants as green. So we can obtain the reflectance values of different land cover types across the visible and infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum to create signatures like the figure you see here. In green, you can see a typical vegetation signature. 
that has a small reflectance peak in the green portion of the spectrum and a very high peak in the near infrared portion of the spectrum. Soil tends to have a steadily decreasing reflectance value in the visible and near infrared, which you can see here in the brown line. And water tends to absorb most energy. Therefore, the is low throughout with um, a small peak in the blue that you can see here. So now that we've reviewed how objects interact with solar radiation, the next thing to understand is how the satellites and sensors collect that information. Passive remote sensing, such as Landsat, depends on the sun as the sole source of illumination. Solar radiation passes through the atmosphere, hits a target surface, such as a forest, water, or built up area, like the example shown here, and the energy is either transmitted, absorbed, or reflected. As we previously discussed, different materials reflect and absorb different wavelengths. And then the satellite sensors collect the reflected radiation in these various wavelengths. When we display the imagery from these sensors, we choose three color channels to display. The nomenclature here is a little confusing, so bear with me. Um, for the first example, if we put the red band in the red color channel, the green band in the green channel, and the blue band in the blue, we see a um, natural color image, like the image that you see on the top right here. And this is how you view imagery in things like Google Earth Engine, which we'll be using later. Remote sensing specialists also like to change which bands or wavelengths we look at um, to put into specific color channels so that features on the ground become more apparent. For example, we mentioned that healthy vegetation reflects a lot in the near infrared. So if we put the near infrared band into the red channel, the vegetation will appear bright red as shown in this second image. This is what we often call false color. Similarly, if we put the near infrared band into the green channel, the vegetation appears very bright green, as you can see in the bottom image here. So these are just some techniques that we like to use to display imagery and identify different features more clearly. For this uh, exercise and throughout this training, we will really focus on the natural color image, but I wanted to make you aware of these different variations that we can look at throughout the imagery. So when we create a land cover classification, we take groups of pixels that have similar spectral signatures, such as all of the healthy vegetation, and categorize them into classes like water, forest, urban, agriculture, et cetera. There are many techniques that we use for land cover classification. Generally, classification requires assessment of the statistics of the pixels in the image, such as the minimum reflectance in each band and the maximum, the mean, and standard deviation. We can then plot this information such as the reflectance values from two specific bands or wavelength ranges to identify groups of land cover types, like the figures shown here on the right. All of the pixels that fall within a designated range of those statistics are grouped and given class labels. This can be done in a supervised or unsupervised manner. With the supervised classification, the user provides training data or ground truth to assist in the classification. With an unsupervised algorithm, the computer generally iterates on the classes and eventually finds the best fit or the best groups of classes. For this series, we will be using the random forest classification algorithm, which is one of the most popular for land cover classification. The computer creates an ensemble model where it chooses a random subset of pixels and assigns them a class based on their spectral information 
and then iterates on this process many times. As we just reviewed in the previous slides, this is the similar model um, that, that the computer runs to conduct the classification. The algorithm also sets aside one third of the pixels to assess error. This is a type of supervised learning in the form of decision trees like those that you can see here. As with any classification algorithm, there are pros and cons. There is no need to prune or cut back on your data because this algorithm does, does that automatically. Pruning is a technique in machine learning and search algorithms that reduces the size of decision trees by removing sections of the tree that provide little power to the decision. Pruning reduces the complexity of the final classifier and hence improves the predictive accuracy by the reduction of overfitting. Therefore, overfitting is not generally a problem and the algorithm is not sensitive to outliers. Because of this decision tree model, it's also really easy to parameterize. The training data or the correctly identified pixels are really important to this algorithm as it uses only the spectral range of those data to run the classification. While these slides presented a really brief overview of land cover classification, I also suggest that if you have additional questions or interest in this portion of our presentation, you can take a look at um, previous RSET courses um, that we have for the land management application area for land cover classification and accuracy assessment. And we talk about these uh, themes much more um, thoroughly throughout those. So do go back to the RSET website and take a look at those as well. While we have described the benefits and applications of the use of optical data for land cover classification, there are also some disadvantages. When monitoring vegetation over small regions, the spatial resolution of NASA data, for example, 30 meters from Landsat, may not be able to discern the level of detail you need on the ground. This will necessitate broad classes of land cover where you cannot differentiate species of vegetation. Additionally, the spectral information um, of these sensors uh, is not sensitive to variations in um, different vegetation species, for example, and in those kinds of classifications, you would need something like a hyperspectral sensor to differentiate those. Additionally, in tropical regions, it may be difficult to obtain cloud-free images for your analysis, and optical data does not penetrate clouds, smoke, or forest canopy. And we'll talk about this a little later as well. So it's really important to be aware of these limitations and Consider this when using optical or radar data um, individually or side by side for your types of classification. So now that we've uh, discussed optical data and land cover classification um, a little bit, let's now compare optical and radar data. Forest monitoring using remote sensing is an important aspect of many international and regional to protect forest resources, such as the framework convention of climate change, reducing emissions from deforestation or forest degradation, also known as Red Plus. Tracking deforestation rates on an annual basis and developing early warning systems of forest loss, often from illegal activity is really critical to these. Optical data sets have long been the primary data used for this type of monitoring. Yet SAR data has now become operational and offers unique advantages. One of these advantages is the ability to observe the surface of the earth, regardless of whether it is day or night and almost dur during almost any type of weather condition. The latter is particularly useful for tropical countries 
which tend to have continuous cloud cover and very limited availability of optical data. So as we previously discussed, optical image images obtain data in the visible and infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, as you can see in this figure here. While radar data collect is collected at much larger wavelengths in the microwave portion of the spectrum that you can also see in this image. Because optical sensors mostly collect data in the visible portion and only obtain passive reflected energy, they really only function in the daytime. There are some exceptions for this um, for NASA data, like the thermal bands of the MODIS and VIR sensors that can be used to detect nighttime wildfires but this is generally the case for optical sensors. Microwaves or radar data, on the other hand, can penetrate clouds and vegetation can, data can be collected at any time. The main difference between optical and radar data for land cover mapping is that optical is sensitive to the spectral properties of the vegetation and soil while radar is sensitive to the structure and the moisture content of the land surface. Radar is essentially sensitive to the bulk of the vegetation or biomass and the geometry and moisture content of the vegetation and soil. Thus, the information provided by radar is different than that provided by optical sensors. With optical, you can get things like the normalized difference vegetation index, or the NDVI, or the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, as an indicator of vegetation health using um, multiple bands and calculating a ratio. While with radar, you cannot. An another difference is that optical data are available from visible to infrared wavelengths, several bands of data, which can offer different information on land cover characteristics based on those um, spectral reflectance properties that we discussed earlier. Radar, on the other hand, usually consists of one to two bands of data and at most four bands. As a last point, optical sensors only see surface tops because the canopy blocks whatever, whatever is underneath. This limits characterizing land cover unless the characteristics of the top of the canopy are highly correlated with what is underneath. With radar, the signal can penetrate through the canopy, depending on the wavelength, and provide information on the vegetation and soil below. So here we have a list of the advantages and disadvantages of radar remote sensing. Two of the greatest advantages of radar over optical is that since radar is active, meaning that it has its own illumination, it can observe the surface of the earth during either day or night conditions. Another great advantage is that radar observations can be done almost under almost any type of weather condition, like we mentioned previously, making radar really useful for regions that are consistently cloud covered like the tropics. Also, the radar signal can penetrate through the vegetation canopy while optical only sees the very top. In addition, with radar remote sensing, there are minimal to no atmospheric effects or corrections needed, whereas the optical data are um, affected by the atmosphere and need to be corrected for that. Finally, radar is very sensitive to the moisture properties of the surface and to the structure, whereas the optical is only sensitive to those spectral characteristics. One of the greatest issues with radar data is that sometimes it's difficult to interpret. Also, radar images are characterized by speckle, which is a salt and pepper effect that makes it difficult to interpret the image. However, there are ways to address this through filtering, um, as Erica talked about um, during our last session. Finally, the presence of topography introduces distortions in the radar which need to be accounted for. And as a final comment, historic SAR images tend to have low temp temporal repeat on the order of 
40 plus days. So that means that it's um, imaging the same place on Earth every 40 days or longer. So make, that makes the availability of a time series of data scarce. However, this is changing with new um, satellites and sensors such as Sentinel-1, which has a 12-day repeat time. Given these attributes of radar data, there are a number of applications for using radar for land cover mapping and monitoring. And these include mapping forests, wetlands, biomass, monitoring disturbance, such as fires or selective logging, or monitoring changes such as deforestation and reforestation. There are added advantages of utilizing these unique features of both optical and radar data to improve upon our land cover classification. And that's what we'll be um, doing today with our exercise. Using both data sets can provide more detailed characterization of land cover changes. For example, optical data can be used to identify broad classes of land cover or change, and then radar could be used to identify the attributes of those classes, like surface roughness or soil moisture. This can be especially useful for agriculture, forest disturbance, and land degradation. Here, vegetation health indices, such as the NDVI we mentioned earlier, can be used in conjunction with plant structure and volume data available from the radar. So these are all things to keep in mind when conducting a land cover classification and monitoring change in your region. So now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Erica Potis, who will be walking you through our Google Earth Engine land cover classification exercise. So over to you, Erica. Great, thank you very much, Amber. So let's get started with this demo. And we are gonna be focusing in the same area as the previous demo, the time series demo. This is an area in Brazil, in the state of Rondonia. And let's just start out by um, visualizing the Sentinel-1 data. So what you do here is uh, you go up to the, the box to up here and you type in Sentinel-1 and you click on it and it'll tell you all of the details of the Sentinel SAR data that's on Google Earth Engine, the entire database. So there's a description, talks about the bands, the different polarizations, resolutions, uh, image prop properties, terms of use. So what's important here is that the Sentinel-1 images that are on Google Earth Engine, they are image analysis, uh, they're analysis ready, these images. So they have been processed already and there's been a thermal noise removal that has been applied to them, radiometric calibration and terrain correction. So the only thing that needs to be done to these images is to apply a speckle filter. One thing to note is that the values are in decibels. So that means it's a, a log 10 value, all right? So that's very important and, uh, uh, to remember that the values are already in decibels, okay? And so the optical images that we're gonna use are from Landsat 8. So if you wanna learn more about the, the metadata and characteristics of that data set, just type in Landsat 8 up here, click on the search window, oops, Landsat 8, click on the search window. And there are a number of different Landsat 8 uh, um, images or data sets. And the one we want to select is the is this one, the Landsat 8 surface reflectance tier one. Okay, so again, there's all sorts of uh, information about the 
the data set and the bands and image properties. Okay, so let's get started then. Um, so now it's, we've talked about the Sentinel-1 data set that we'll be using and we've talked about the Landsat data, 8 data set that we will be using. The first thing we wanna do is identify our area of interest. So what we wanna do is we want to go here. We select the draw a line icon on the top left, select that. And then let's, our area of interest is more or less, uh, it doesn't have to be exact what you draw. Uh, is more or less this area. And then what you'll do is let's rename that because the, the default name, I just created a new one. I didn't mean to do that. So let's go ahead and delete it. And then the one that I just created, the default name is geometry. So let's call it ROI for region of interest. Okay, so that's our area of interest. And then the next thing we do is we filter the Sentinel-1 data sets, database, okay, for BV images. So let's just copy this code. And we paste it up here. Okay, so what this does is we are querying the Sentinel-1 database on Google Earth Engine, and this is the name of that database. Okay, so this is, here's, we're querying it, and we are filtering according to instrument mode. So the images that we're filtering for are IW, which is interferometric wide swath, and those are the images we want to use because that's, um, it, those are the acquisitions, the primary acquisitions over land. And then we want to filter for BV polarization, descending pass, 10 meter resolution. Uh, we want to filter according to the area that we just defined, the ROI, and select BV. And then we want to print here the images that fall within our area of interest. Okay. And then we go back and we want to repeat the same thing but for VH, for the VH polarization. So it's the same code. We come back and we paste it. And here we are filtering the exact same thing, except it's VH, All right? Then the next thing we do is we will, let's uh, make sure you save your code. And then we run it. And what we get here is going to be this is telling us that over this region of interest within the entire data, Sentinel 1 database on Google Earth Engine, there's 631 BV images and 627 BH. All right, so now what we want to do is we don't want to work with that entire database, so we filter it to a certain date by a date range. So we copy this code and paste it here. So now what we're doing is we're taking all of those images that fall within our region of interest or somewhere within our region of interest. And we filter that by date. And in this case, we're setting the date to be between August 1st, 1st 2019 to August 10, 2019. So we're doing that filtering by date for both BV and VH. So, The next thing we do is we 
add the images to layers, to the layers bar, okay, in order to be able to visualize the images. So let's go, let's do this. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're saying, all right, whatever was, whatever image coverage for the BV polarization for the date specified here, add that to the layers bar and add the VH coverage as well for that specific date range. Okay. And so let's just save and then run. So if you go to your layers bar up here on the top right of your map and you click on SAR-VV, you, uh, you will have the image displayed. And you can see that there are uh, two images, at least uh, within this time frame. You can clearly see here. And then let's take a look at BH. Okay. Now, in order to, what we've done here is we've, we've indicated how we want that image displayed, the stretch of the values, but you can change that. So if you go to, you click here on the cog wheel, uh, you can change that, that, um, that's, that, that, value, the stretch of the values. So if we say 27 instead of 25, it's, it's not as dark. There's a larger range to which um, the image display, the values in the image uh, displayed are stretched. All right. So the next thing we do, we've got our Sentinel-1 images identified. The next thing we do is we work now with the optical images and bringing those. Now, the first thing we wanna do is to create a mask for the areas where there's shadow and where there are clouds. Okay, so let's just copy this code and paste it. So the Landsat 8 images, they have a, um, a quality band um, that identifies where there's cloud, where there are clouds and where there's a shadow due to the clouds. So basically what we're doing here is we are creating a mask using those two uh, quality flags, clouds and, and uh, shadows. And then we extract the images from the Landsat 8 database, okay? So the Landsat 8 collection, this is what it's called. So we're querying that collection for the, this time period, which is the same as the Sentinel-1. And we are uh, querying it for images that fall within our area of interest. And we're applying this mask that, that we've created, right, with the quality flags. And then we're printing here on the console the number of images that um, were identified for our area of interest. Okay, so let's just save. And let's run. We have, if you click here, it indicates that there are two images for the area identified. Okay, so the other thing we want to do is we want to calculate NDVI because we're going to use this as an information layer to 
um, inform the classifier. All right, so what we do is just copy this code and then paste it. So what we're doing here is, since there are two images over our area of interest, we're calculating the mean and creating one image called comp. And then NDVI is being calculated from that comp image that we just identified. So bands five and band four. And then we're creating a composite image that has the original bands in the Landsat 8 image. And it's got the NDVI image as well. So the next thing we want to do is we want to add these images to the layer bar. And what we do is we copy this, go back, and then paste that code. And what this does is, again, it's adding this composite image into the layer bar. And what we're doing is we are uh, just displaying band four, band three, band two. So save, and let's run this. There you go. So if you click on the cogwheel on optical and you select, let's select one band, you'll see that you've got all of the Landsat bands. So it's one, bands one through seven and then bands 10 and 11, and then you've got NDVI. So if you wanna just say view the NDVI image, say let's specify the range, So that's the NDVI image. Okay. So now let's go back to our RGB. And one thing we can do is just visualize this image. And you can overlay the SAR image over it to really kind of see or understand the, the, some of the differences. So let's just zoom in. Remember, the dark areas in the SAR image are areas with very, very low vegetation and or bare. And the higher the backscatter, the more vegetation there is in that area. So let's just overlay, zoom in a little more. So you can see all kinds of interesting things here. So for example, if you take a look at this area, you see it's slightly lower backscatter, this area in here, than this area. And you can see that in the optical image, there is a slightly darker green tone in that area. However, if you take a look at this area, for example, it's, it's, um, it's a slightly lower tone than this area out here, but when you overlay the optical image, the green tones are, are higher. Okay.
So it's good to do a visual comparison. Now remember that this is just, uh, these are just uh, bands um, four, three, and two in the optical. All right. So the next thing we want to do, we've got both of our images, Sentinel-1 and the Landsat-8 um, load identified. And the next thing we do is we apply a, a speckle filter to the radar images. Okay, so. So we copy that, and this is just a, uh, an, an average that we're calculating. It's a smoothing filter. And then let's copy this to display the filtered images. OK, so save and run. So what we're doing here is we are adding the filtered, the SAR filtered images onto the layers bar, okay, both the VV and the VH. So let's, uh, let's just bring this up. And let's zoom in so you can see the difference. Okay, so let's overlay the unfiltered image. So that's the unfiltered image, and this is the filtered image. Unfiltered and filtered, right? So you see that that speckle has been reduced in the filtered image uh, considerably, but you do lose spatial detail. And that is just part of the nature of applying a speckle filter, unless you do some sort of time series averaging. All right. So the next step is We've got our images, they're ready. Now what we need to do is we need to select training data. Remember, we're gonna be applying a random forest classifier. And this is a, based on a supervised classification approach. So that means we need to identify training areas in our image, okay? So the way you identify training areas is the same way you selected that, uh, the ROI. Okay, so let's just identify a training area. Let's go through one example here. You go to the draw a shape icon on the top left of the map, select that, and select new layer. Okay, so let's uh, train for open water. And Let's just draw our polygon to identify areas that are characteristic of open water along this river. And it's good to select a couple of polygons it's really not so much about how many polygons you select because you could have a polygon that's a thousand pixels or, or, or a polygon that's eight pixels. So it's what you want to do is have a good statistical representation or sampling of that class. 
Okay, so that means you want a couple of hundred pixels at least. So just, just make sure there. And since we are gonna be using those same training areas for our optical image, let's just make sure that the training areas that are selected overlap with the optical image, okay? So all of the training areas along the river for open water that we've selected are also within the optical image. All right, so now what we'll do is you go to into, into geometry imports, you click on the cog wheel and let's rename this. This is our first class and I will rename it open water and prefer water to be bright blue. So I will change that and under geometry, click on that and then select feature collection and then select add properties. So what you wanna do is you wanna, this is the feature collection called land cover. All of the classes that we'll be selecting, identifying are gonna be under the feature collection called land cover. And then the value is one. So this is our first class. Okay. So let's just say, okay. All right, so then what I've done has been to identify areas based on the backscatter in intensity, based on what we know about the backscatter characteristics. So we know that areas that are very dark are areas where there is little to no vegetation. So the next thing we wanna do is we wanna uh, train a second class. And to do that, you go to, again, Go to the draw a, uh, a polygon option, okay? And we will identify a new, new layer. And let's call this second class bare fields. And just make them red, our bare fields. Again, under geometry, go to feature collection at property, so all of the classes that we're identifying, they're under the feature collection called land cover. This is the second class that we identify, so it will be number two, class number two. Okay. So let's go, and we know from the backscatter characteristics that uh, of radar that the areas that are very dark are areas where there's low, very either very low vegetation or the fields are bare. So let's pick some of these areas where we see very, very low backscatter. And so let's, there, that's our first training, our first polygon within bare fields. Let's find another very dark area. Again, make sure that the training classes that you're selecting are also within the optical images uh, because we will use those same training classes for the optical images, okay? To train the optical uh, classifier. So here's another one of those. So let's draw another polygon in here. Here's another one. So we have three, how about here? Okay. 
Okay, so we identified four polygons here. And then you go ahead and define another class. So let's click on new layer. And the way I've done this example has just been based on the uh, radar backscatter intensity, right? So we're starting out with very dark and we're moving our way up, defining different classes um, depending on the, their intensity, right? So let's just name the next class. I'll just call it vegetation one, vegetation one. Okay. Again, feature collection, land cover, and this is the third class that we're identifying. All right, so the next thing I do is uh, I'll identify the next class on um, backscatter values that are slightly higher than the previous class. So let's say this area here. And by the way, if you want to see the value of a pixel, just go to inspector and click on inspector up here in the window in the top right. And then if you, anywhere you click, oops, just make sure you deselect there. So anywhere you click, there. Anywhere you click, you will uh, get the values for everything that you have under layers, all of your images under layers. So in this case, we have the VH filtered image. And for that particular pixel that I clicked on, minus 21 dB. Okay, so if you, you click here over water, um, minus 33 dB. If we click here, somewhere here, minus 23 dB, okay. So if you wanna see the values, get a sense of the, the, the values of the different areas, just use the inspector. Okay, so what I've done it has been to identify uh, four different types of vegetation classes with different backscatter. So the higher the vegetation train class, the higher the backscatter. And the highest backscatter would be forest. All right. So the next thing that we do is we've identified the classes. Then we need to merge the uh, feature collections. And to do that, copy this code. And we will paste it. So we're here in line 69. So we paste it and I'll just deselect it from my code. So what we're doing is we're merging. We're taking all of the classes that we identified. In this case, seven classes, open water, bare fields, vegetation one, two, three, four, and then forest. Okay. So we're merging that into, we're calling it new FC, new feature collection. All right. So then the next step is to classify the image. So what we'll be doing is we'll be classifying just the SAR image first, then just the, uh, the optical image, and then we'll be running a classification with both of them. So let's run the first classification on the SAR, the Sentinel SAR image. And the first thing we do is we create the, the training data from Sentinel-1. So let's just copy this code and then paste it. I've got it here already. So I'll just deselect. And so what this is doing is this is saying, okay, create the training statistics based on these classes um, 
uh, overlaid on the Sentinel SAR images, the filtered SAR images VH and VV. Okay. All right, so the next thing we do is we've created our training statistics from the SAR data. And we take those statistics, those training data sets, and we uh, basically um, train the random forest classifier with those training data sets. All right, so I'll just deselect and basically we are calling the random forest classifier up here. That's what we're doing. So we're training, we're creating a training data set that features the training sets, the, the training classes. And we are using the land cover feature collection and the VH and VV bands. Okay. And then once we train that classifier, then we run the classifier. And this is just a, a one line piece of code here. You copy this and you paste it. We'll deselect it in my case. And so what we're doing is we're running this classifier on bands, which is we're using both BV and VH. And we are calling the classification classifier. Okay, so that's our uh, classification image. So the next thing we want to do is we want to then display those results, the classification results. And let's just deselect this. So this is all in the PowerPoint. Um, you copy, this is the code. And so what this code is doing is it's adding that image with the classification results, it's called classify, to the layers uh, as a band in, in the layers bar. Okay, so we've got the classified image and basically we're assigning a color to each of the classes that we identify. Okay, so let's save this and we run it. So th this is the result, this is the classified backscatter image, um, BV and VH. And if you go to the layers bar, it's SAR classification. And let's just zoom in a little bit. So if we zoom in, we can see the results and remember so these are the different classes, uh, bare fields in red, and then increasing level of vegetation with these different vegetation classes that I defined. And then uh, forest has the highest level of backscatter. And if you zoom in, there are some issues. There's still some effect of, of this speckle. Okay, so let's, uh, and, and you can then overlay the SAR VH image to. Just to visually see the patterns that it picked up. Okay, so one thing that we want to do, as with any classification result, you want to assess the accuracy. So the next thing we do is we uh, we create a compute. We're going to create a confusion matrix, and we're going to also calculate the um, the accuracy of the results. All right, so um, we copy and paste that code, and so let's just. Put it here and so what this is doing is um, 
it is calculating the generating a confusion matrix based on the, um, the, the classifier, right? So the training classes that we selected and it's ge generating an, the accuracy results based on the training classes. Now, this is not a true um, uh, um, accuracy result because we're actually running the accuracy um, uh, uh, calculations based on the training data. In order to get a true accuracy result, you need to select a new set of um, polygons, and those are your validation areas. Okay, so, so we, what we're doing here is we're just running it on the, the training areas. Okay. But this is just to show you how you can generate a confusion matrix and your accuracy results. So here on the console on the right, there is a window that has your, your error matrix. And just click on it to open it. And here we have our seven classes that we trained. Uh, so disregard the, the zero. And the way you read this is, so for the first class, and that was open water, there we identified 8,668 pixels as training classes and they were all classified correctly. Okay, so in terms of the overall accuracy, the overall accuracy is 93.5%. Now that's only based on the training data, so it's not really the true accuracy. Um, to Again, to determine the true accuracy, you need to pick an independent set of uh, pixels. All right, so the next thing we do is we apply the classification to the Landsat image only. So in order to run the classifier on the Landsat image, the first thing we need to do is we need to take those polygons, those training polygons that we identified, we need to overlay them on the Landsat image. All right, so um, so what we do is you copy this code, and paste it on the window, and here I've deselected it already. So what we're saying is we want to overlay it and use these bands, bands one through seven, as well as NDVI, to generate our training class statistics, right? So, so we're calling this training L8 for Landsat 8. Okay, so we are defining the bands here. And um, this is the, um, the new F, the, the new um, feature collection that's called land cover, right? So then we go ahead and we train the classifier. It's the same steps that we applied for the SAR image classification. So we train the classifier again, it's random forest. The features are uh, the training, the Landsat 8, based on the bands that we've identified here. And you can change that. You can experiment all you want here and just use a, a handful of bands or you can add other bands too. So for example, you can also add uh, a DM if you like. Okay, so in this case, we, we're just using bands one to seven as well as NDVI, and then we run the classification, okay? So the new classification, the Landsat classification is called classified L8, and it's being run on the bands identified up here, and the training uh, from that we had already I, the training classes that we had identified and we had extracted those statistics over these bands that we identified here. Okay, so we run that and we display the new results, the classification results in the layers band, in the layers bar. So in addition, let's also go ahead and calculate that confusion matrix and the accuracy of our classification. 
So it's the same code as what was used for the SAR classification. Here I've just deselected it and we are specifying that this is based on the uh, Landsat 8 classification. Okay. So, so let's save and we run it. Okay. So let's deselect the SAR classification, select the optical classification, and zoom in. Select optical. So you will notice that this is uh, this is cleaner when you compare it to the SAR-based classification. Uh, you don't have the, 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 the speckle effect. Even though with the SAR we did apply a filter, it is a, a generally a cleaner classification. And then you can compare the results by overlaying the SAR classification to it. And remember, if you've forgotten uh, the color interpretation, it's right here under geometry imports. You can see the different colors assigned to the different vegetation classes. Okay. So that's the SAR classification. That's the optical classification. Now, if you, let's take a look at the error matrix for Landsat 8. You can understand where there's been confusion. This is, again, based on the training classes. And then the overall accuracy is 97.5%. All right, so the last part here is we've ran a classification with just the SAR, just the optical. Now we're running the random forest classifier on both the optical and the SAR. So to do that, again, let's go back to our PowerPoint. So what we need to do now is overlay our training points on both the optical and the SAR data sets. And so let's just you copy that code. I've got it here already, so I'm just going to deselect it. Okay. And what I'm saying here is now we are going to be using the a Landsat image, we're using bands one through seven, as well as NDVI in the Landsat image, and we're using the SAR VV and VH filtered images. Okay. So the next thing we do is we train that classifier. So we train the random forest classifier. And we run the classification. So now here I'm calling the classification. It's called classified both. And let's display the results and create a confusion matrix. 
So make sure you save and you run. All right, so in the layers bar, you'll have our, the new image, the new classified image, optical SAR classification. So let's just select that. And what we've done, I forgot to mention, one additional thing that we've done here has been to clip the classification display, to clip it to the area that overlaps um, between both images. So we've created a mask identifying the common areas, the common overlap areas between the SAR and the Landsat image. And the classification result of um, both of those are over that clipped area. So you can then compare both of them by overlaying the optical classification on the optical SAR classification. And there are some, some differences. And then you can also overlay the SAR classification. So that's the SAR and that's the optical SAR. So that's the SAR classification, the optical SAR classification. And then if you want to um, assess your results, you've got the error matrix printed out here, as well as the, um, the accuracy. So what this is indicating is that the accuracy when you use both images is slightly higher than just using the optical image. So that concludes our exercise. And in, in review, uh, I've shown you here how to load Sentinel images, Landsat images, how to run a classification, a supervised classification using random forest on each image, how to assess its accuracy, even though, as you know, you actually have to pick independent uh, validation areas to have a correct assessment of the accuracy of your classification. And then I showed you how to uh, run random forest using both the Landsat and the SAR image. So that concludes this demo, and now we will begin our Q&A session. Before we go into the Q&A, I just wanted, want to remind you that the next session is next Tuesday, the same time, and it will be on mangrove mapping using SAR. And then next Thursday, we'll have our final session that will be on forest height estimation. And that one will be by guest lecturer, Professor Paul Cicada from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So please go ahead and type in your questions into the chat box. I will be answering as many questions as I can. And all questions and answers will be posted on the RSET training website um, following the conclusion of the course. Great. So what we've done is we've compiled the questions that you've been already typing in the chat box. 
and we uh, put them in this Google Doc that you see on the screen. So we'll be going through them. Uh, a lot of really great questions. Before I get to the questions, I'd like to uh, give a quick thank you to Zachary Bengston, Gina Kova, and John Dilger for their help uh, with uh, the code in Google Earth Engine. And I'd also like to make an announcement that the link to the code is in the PDF presentation. So we've updated the code from last week, uh, sorry, from uh, last Tuesday as well. And uh, you will see the link to that code as well. So uh, go ahead and download the new version of the presentation, the time series presentation, if you want access to the, uh, to the code, to the demo that we went through. All right, so let's get started with the questions. Is SAR imagery good for monitoring forest sanitation? Okay, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure what is meant by forest sanitation, sanitation specifically. Um, perhaps this person can uh, uh, send a clarification in the chat box. Okay. Question number two, I can't wait for Google Earth Engine. However, my Google Earth Engine login details won't work. Can you guys help with Google Earth Engine login? Yeah, sorry, we cannot help with that. I mean, that is independent of us, uh, but you can check the Google Earth Engine help webpage and see what sort of assistance you can get. So usually the login is approved within 24 hours. Question number three, will Sentinel Toolbox load on 32-bit Windows machines? That's a good question. I don't have a Windows machine, so I uh, am much less a 32-bit one. I, I wouldn't know. Uh, what you need to do is go to the page where you can download the Sentinel Toolbox, and it will tell you the, the computer requirements uh, to run the software. Question four. As you mentioned, supervised and unsupervised classification algorithm, how about hybrid approach in comparison with the two mentioned methods? Could it yield a better results? Yeah, possibly, especially um, in a case like this, for example, I, uh, I, I didn't have a, a validation data or training data. So if you don't have good uh, ground data, reference data, what you can do is uh, you can generate, say, a first cut of um, the different clusters, say, in, in your image based on uh, a backscatter or reflectance. So you can do that through an unsupervised classification approach and then use that to train a supervised uh, classifier. Okay, so you take those, those clusters, however many classes you define in your unsupervised classification, and then you can um, use those to inform the, the training classes for your supervised classification. Okay. And, and um, Dr. McCollum has also um, added to this question. So there are also techniques that address spatial dependence, such as the impact of topography on land cover types. And you can do this by adding something like a DEM to your classification algorithm. And, uh, and, and she's included a link here to a hybrid approach. Okay, so we move on to the next question. Okay, so the question is, which one method is recommended in the area of atmospheric element classification into homogeneous regions such as rainfall regions. Hmm. 
Yeah, I don't, this question, I don't understand either atmospheric elements classification. Maybe this person can clarify. I mean, we're looking at land cover here. But maybe if you want to identify land cover according to different uh, regional patterns, right? In, in uh, say rainfall, uh, you might want to look at areas that are greener or areas that have higher NDVI or higher vegetation. Can forest, question number six, can forest monitoring be done with Doable. I'm finding that quad pole is great for forest cover classification scores, but is more temporally limited than doable. That is correct. I mean, that's what we did here. I think this person might have typed in the question before the demo, but as you saw, we've done this classification using VV and VH. Do we need to worry about topographic corrections for radar? Yes, definitely. Uh, but uh, in the case of the radar imagery that's on the Google Earth engine, it's been already corrected for topography. So there's a terrain correction that has been applied to the imagery. If you're processing the, your data, so say, for example, you download the data through the Alaska Satellite Facility and you need to run the processing steps on the imagery, then one of the things you need to do is you need to apply a terrain correction to correct for topography. And you would do this using the Sentinel toolbox. Question eight, can we import training sites to Google Earth Engine for land classification collected by GPS from the field? If so, how do we import the training sites? I, I believe you can. There are different ways of importing uh, your own imagery and data sets and vector files into Google Earth Engine. I don't specifically, I've never uh, um, done this, so I don't have any code with me, but if you send me a, an email, I'd be happy to uh, probably point you somewhere online where there's a code to do this. And you might want to also do a search uh, for uh, Google Earth Engine forums. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, many forums online where people discuss uh, what sort of things uh, you can do with Google Earth Engine or what sort of uh, roadblocks they've been running into and people share their experience. So those are always really good resources. Question number nine. One of the limitations of optical is the inability of penetrating smoke and cloud, but we can't we eliminate this limitation by taking line set images taken in the dry season? Yeah, absolutely, you can. Um, but in some places, believe it or not, uh, you don't even get good imagery in the or, or clear images in the dry season. And so some areas are limited. Remember that the, the um, if you take into account the repeat pass of, of Landsat, which is about every two weeks, um, yeah, some areas are, are just not clear. And, and so that's where uh, radar can become very, very useful. Now, if you're looking at dynamic processes, it's even more useful to have radar. So if, say you want to look at like recent deforestation or, um, or something that occurs in a relatively short time frame, then radar is, is extremely useful because sometimes to have a clear optical image, it might take months if, if even. Okay, and, and uh, um, another example is if you're looking at like monitoring agriculture, you, um, you need to take into account the seasonality and think about the dates when the imagery is obtained. 
All right. So let's go on to the next question. It's been stated that radar can penetrate through the soil. Yes, it has been stated. So can radar help us know different types of soil? If so, how? Hmm. Yeah, that um, that it it cannot. It's it, it's such a fine difference. It just don't the the radar signal just does not have that level of sensitivity. So radar can tell you the amount of water in the soil. Even that is uh, is not straightforward. But the different types of soil that's that's tough. You need some uh, you need to inform a model for that. Okay. Question 11, in the slide 21, could you explain a little more when radar, which is sensitive to structure and the topographic difference cause distortions in the data? I have doubt because the structure can be natural comes from the topography. So both ideas can exchange and cause confusion. Okay, so I think what this person means is when you have some topography in areas of topography, you might have, say, high backscatter. And these areas can be confused sometimes with things like inundated vegetation. So I think that's what this person is referring to. Okay, question number 12. Why not Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1? What motivates the use of Landsat-8? Knowing the difference in both temporal and spatial resolution. Yeah, that's a great point. And Sentinel-2 is a really a great option as well for optical data and could be used in a similar manner to the way we, we use the Landsat 8. What we just shows Landsat 8 for this example, you can easily, the idea behind this code is for you to learn how to do the process, right? So the idea here is for you to be able to take this code and modify it to your specific needs, to your specific rate region of interest, time frame, et cetera. Just replace Landsat 8 with Sentinel-2 and, and run it and explore too. Um, here we used, you saw all of the bands that we defined using Landsat 8. You can just use a, a handful of those bands. You can pull in a DM if you like. There are many things that you can do, explore. But I think you have the tools here to start exploring. You know how to uh, composite an image. So you create one image that has multiple images in it. You can do many things now. Okay, so... So things to consider, obviously, when you're choosing the imagery is the time period available, of available data, the spatial and spectral resolution, and the repeat time of um, the sensor. So when you go back in time, Landsat uh, is very useful because it goes way back. It goes back decades. Why is descending pass important? What is the purpose of filtering by descending orbital pass? That's a good question. There tend to be more images in the descending pass. So that was really kind of trial and error. There were more images in the descending pass um, for, the, for, the area, for that area. Um, but if you're not finding images in the descending pass, do a filter for the ascending and see what's there. One thing to always keep in mind, do not mix them. If you're doing an analysis, a classification, time series, whatever you're doing, do not mix descending and ascending. Keep them separate. So either work with descending or work with ascending. Radar is highly affected by topography. Hence, is radar data applicable to make land cover company in areas with undulating topographies? Um, you might have some errors in area, especially with complex topography. Undulating topography, um, 
uh, your land cover is going to look a little different. So you need to train accordingly. A forest in an area where you have topography might look different than a forest in a flat area. Okay, so you need to train accordingly. Question 15, if you're in an area where terrain creates a shadow, how would you automatically deline delineate shadow in SAR? You can identify it in the Landsat 8, but wondering if you could do that in SAR. Yeah, that's a great question. You can do that using a, a DEM. So you can uh, use a DEM basically to based on areas where you have complex topography and based on areas where it's uh, very very low backscatter at the at the noise floor, then you can just mask those areas out as shadow. Question sixteen: Are there any radar data sets or systems available for the 1980s or 1990s to create a time series from 1980s until now? Yes, that's another really great question. I invite you to go to the Alaska Satellite Facility. And they have a, uh, a number of different SAR data sets. Um, and some of them you can download uh, for free. Uh, there's one uh, over select areas, OK? So there's one that is called JERS-1. That was a Japanese L-band SAR sensor that uh, flew in the 90s in space. And I, I believe uh, this data is available over select areas. Okay. And you might want to explore, there's also ERS data. That's data from a, um, a SAR C-band sensor from the European Space Agency that flew in the 90s and 2000s. And there is select ERS data um, over certain parts of the world that you can download for free. So just go and explore. You can draw your um, area of interest and uh, explore what sort of radar data is available over the time period that you're interested in. While question 17, while setting the dates for filtering, do we know to first check the availability of data for the dates we select, or is data available at any dates in all areas? Yeah, so remember Sentinel 1 has a 12 day uh, repeat pass. Okay. So, so setting the dates for filtering is a bit of a trial and error thing. If you set one date, um, you know, you've got couple of days there, um, almost two weeks where you don't have coverage, right? So uh, you, you want to set a, a range of dates to see what sort of coverage you have. Well, you might want to start with three days, maybe that there's coverage during those three days uh, or so at some point during those three days. Uh, so yeah, this is a trial and error, just setting those dates. Okay, question 18, can we be made a supervised classification with an averaged image from a temporal interval? Yes, actually, that's another way. So you saw that with the, uh, applying the speckle filter, you have some level of spatial resolution degradation. And that's gonna depend on the size of the speckle filter window. Now, uh, another way to do it is you can just do a, a, if you have a time series, you can do a time series average, and that's gonna uh, reduce your speckle. Now, if you have things changing in your image, though, you know, if during this time series, then uh, you're gonna lose, it's gonna get averaged out. So if you have images where you've got an increase in vegetation or a loss in vegetation, if you average everything out, you're gonna lose some of that information, okay? Question 19, how can we add another DM of better resolution than SRTM? So what I suggest is go into Google Earth Engine up in that, that uh, search window on the top and just do a search for DM and see what's available. There might be a DM that's available uh, for your specific area 
that's not global. So just search and there are ways to upload your own DM if you have one uh, onto Google Earth Engine. Question 20. Can we mask the vector file here in Google Earth Engine to limit our analysis with precise ROI boundaries? Yes, I, I believe you can. I, um, I think I know what you're asking. Uh, I think, so this might be similar to what we did in the time series demo where we created an, an extra mask and, and calculated statistics within that area. Or can you create a vector file? I and I or you could upload a vector file um, to Google Earth Engine. Question 21. Is there literature you can connect this with about the smoothing filter and how it changes the data? How does the loss of spatial detail affect your study? Um, yeah, there are there there is um, literature out there on different speckle filters, and there are a number of different ones. Uh, here is uh, we we put in uh, two references here. Uh, one is on modus data, but the second one. I, uh, the, uh, you can explore both of these. Uh, you can also send me an email and I can send you some references on specific smoothing filters, but you can see in the example we, we did, uh, when you see them side by side, there is spatial resolution loss. Again, you can explore running your classification just on the unspeckled SAR images and see how that translates into your final classification. What is the best polarization for agriculture monitoring? Hmm. Yeah, so this depends on the type of crop, uh, etc. We had a, a great guest lecturer um, in one of our RSET webinars, and she talked about this, uh, the different polarizations for different types of crops. And so uh, we invite you to explore that webinar. It's called Exploiting SAR to Monitor Agriculture. And that was done back in um, last year, 2019. Question 23, is there a minimum size for a training polygon? What if the training samples are known? How can you bring them in? So yeah, there is a minimum size in the sense that you don't wanna select a polygon that has two pixels or four pixels, but you want to uh, uh, select one. You, you wanna have a training area that has at least 10 pixels, okay, 10 or 20 pixels. If your air areas are that small, then you wanna select several polygons because you wanna have overall for each training area, a couple of hundred pixels. Remember, you want each training area or training class to be well uh, characterized statistically, okay? Question 24, great question. How can you be sure that those dark areas are bare soil and not, for example, water? Yes, that is a common, common source of confusion with radar. And uh, that's where optical comes in. You overlay the optical image and it's clear. It'll be, um, 
clear, clearer or much clearer, uh, whether that is a bare soil or whether it's water. Especially in this case where we're not using ground reference data. So um, we rely on some other source to really um, identify these different areas. Question 25. I mean, how much training data is sufficient? Are there any rules? Does it depend on the application? Um, as I said, I don't you want a good statistical representation of each training class. So at least I would say 200, 300 pixels for each class, if not um, more. Okay. Can we estimate above ground tree biomass using Google Earth Engine SAR data? Yeah, this is another great question. There are algorithms out there on how to estimate above ground tree biomass. It's not straightforward um, in the sense that it's not, um, it's not an NDVI equation, for example. Um, it is, there is a certain level of complexity to calculate or estimate above ground biomass. Uh, there is a tutorial out there. However, I'm not sure uh, if, uh, if this has been done with Google Earth Engine or if it can be done with Google Earth Engine. Pixel values, question 27. Pixel values for optical imagery are reflectance. Which value is displayed in radar images in DB? So the values in the radar images are backscatter, which are displayed in, in decibel. So they're power units. Okay. Question 28. What are, can be the criteria to decide which polarization to use for the classification when our focus is on vegetation? Choosing one over the other will affect the accuracy of the classification? Yeah, that's a good question. So listen, HV, the cross pole is better to detect vegetation, okay? The presence of vegetation it tends to be better. and um, choosing one over the other, you know, the nice thing about using random forest is that uh, you don't run into this problem of degrading your results whenever you have a layer, uh, an image that maybe is not helping that much, okay? That's the nice thing about random forest. If you're using something like maximum likelihood, if you have an image that's adding noise or that's not helping very much, that you're gonna see that in the final classification. And you wanna remove that image. With random forest, that's not such a big issue. Um, the problem with random forest might be if you have many images that are highly correlated, then you kind of want to reduce your number of, of images um, that, especially the ones that are highly correlated, where the information content is very similar. So what you need to do or what you should do is explore, right? So run this classification with one polarization. Uh, versus the other and see what the results are. Uh, run it with both polarizations and see what the results are and if they vary significantly. Okay, question 21, 29. Why don't you specify random force parameters like the number of trees, brag, fraction, et cetera? Yeah, good point. There are many parameters that you can specify in random forest. And uh, this is just to get you started and, and for you to have the code. Uh, you can uh, play around with these parameters and see how well uh, or what sort of results you get in your classification. But this is certainly something that you should all be aware of is that there are options that you can set for, for this classifier that might influence your classification results. 
Question 30, as you select pixels for a training set, do you want to pick ones that appear to be pure? This is, they are visually homogeneous, or you know a location is water, forest, et cetera, but display some spectral variation like water uh, with a smooth surface, glint, that it is better to put all types of water into a single training class. Yes, okay. Um, I like to have, try to have my classes relatively pure. Obviously there is some homogeneity in the class. If you have say water that it has roughness on it, that has a lot of roughness on it, um, you might want to just call it rough water as a, just a different training class, call it rough water. And then as this person mentions, then you can combine them. So I personally uh, like to uh, just select different ones. So even if it's water, like sm uh, smooth water or calm water versus uh, rough water, and then you can always combine the classes in your final classification. Okay, question 31. Can the same code be run for high resolution satellite data such as LISIV? And does Google Earth Engine allow to access LIS? Oh, LIS uh, 4. Um, yeah, I'm not, so f I'm not familiar with this data set. You, you, uh, you'll wanna look and do a search in Google Earth Engine on top. See if this data set is already housed within Google Earth Engine. You can adapt this code for any other data set, okay? What you need to do is just redefine your area of interest, your dates, uh, your training classes. And the data sets that you're using. Is there any book available where I can find different spectral reflection backscatter radiation from different features available on Earth? Um, I can't speak for spectral reflection backscatter though. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's a book available. The thing about backscatter is your same class might vary. Yeah, the, the backscatter of a forest uh, might vary in different parts of the world, okay? And it depends on the structure of the forest, on the vegetation water content, it depends on many things, uh, whether it's frozen or not. Uh, so so the, if you want just general values, the range might be quite broad. Question 33. How can we do canopy moisture level using SAR data? Yeah, there are some studies that uh, people are looking at vegetation water content, not canopy, just vegetation water content. It's, um, it, it's complex, but there are some studies out there that are looking at this. Question 34, can you point me to a method to avoid or assess autocorrelation issues between training data and validation? Hmm. I can't think of any. But for sure, there must be yeah, there there must be many different ways to check how well your training data correlates with your validation data. Question thirty five. Other than treating each data separately, is it possible to make a fusion of both Sentinel one and Landsat eight, and then apply the classification? 
If yes, how? Which polarizations to use and what is the extra information to expect out of fusion? Yeah, um, there are some publications out there. Uh, very few have tried doing fusion uh, because at that point you're, you're integrating the, the information content um, from radar and optical. So really the two main ways of running a, a classification with both optical and radar are either uh, you use them together, right? In, in, in a classifier, each, you know, you, you feed the classifier with the optical image and the, the, the radar image, and you write, generate a classification, or another way is you generate a classification from each one, and then based on the classification, you, you can, um, generate a new classification uh, based on the unique information content that's present in each of those classifications. Can one run an unsupervised classification in Google Earth Engine? I believe you can, yes. How will you export the classified map for further reference and map composition? Great question. So there is an export at the end. Um, if you download the PDF, the, uh, the PDF has an, a chart there uh, with instructions on how to export your image. And also when you access the Google code in the presentation, that Google code will, have, uh, will include um, an export option at the end. Question 38, may I be able to import a shapefile with training validation data into Google Earth Engine? I believe you can, yes. I've never done it, but I believe you can import a vector file. Question 39, can we do object-based classification with SAR data? Yes, you can. You can do object-based classifications. Can SAR data be used as an alternative for LIDAR for calculating tree height? Yeah, great question. That's a really, really good question. Actually, the last webinar in this series is going to be focused on um, a calculating forest height. So this is a very timely question. And that webinar is going to be next Thursday. And uh, we'll have a guest speaker, Professor Paul Cicada from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So, uh, I believe in his presentation, he will be do, doing some comparisons with LIDAR um, to show uh, what the differences are. But yes, you can use SAR data as an alternative for LIDAR. Okay. So, Uh, we have a couple of more minutes and I'm going to pick some questions here from the window directly. Let's see. Can we use, can we use random points instead for training data? Um, so here's the thing, anytime you run a supervised classification, right, the, the better the training data, the better your classification results. So you want to have your training data, the ideal thing is to have some sort of reference uh, ground data or use uh, some sort of validated product to generate your training data, as well as your validation data. Um, so random points. Uh, what you can do is just run an unsupervised classification and then use that to inform your, uh, your training. Any recommended books for learning more about random forest? Um, I'm not sure about books, but there are plenty of articles online about random forest.
Is it possible to determine forest fire by this way? Um, yes, so this is a, a method that's been presented here. And if you train accordingly, you, you just need to train to what you're interested in, select your training classes. Uh, and and um, uh, if, it's, if you're specifically looking at forest fires, then, then yes, if you train accordingly, you can apply this. Okay. Okay. How specific can we be in classifying distinct vegetation crops versus biomass? Yeah. This is uh, this is something that I suggest you look at that webinar on agriculture and you can identify some crops. Uh, biomass is an estimation, and there are some errors, obviously, in, in the estimation of biomass, but um, there are uh, ways of doing it. As I said, it's complex. I will be including uh, some reference material of other tutorials and online sources. There's an excellent online source called the SAR Handbook. And it's got a series of different chapters focused on uh, different topics, uh, looking at degradation, looking at estimating biomass, for example. And there's some hands-on uh, um, examples, some uh, uh, tutorials on, on how to do these things. Okay. Okay, this is a good question. Why only using backscatter to select training data and not optical imagery? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's just based on uh, my familiarity with interpreting uh, radar. Um, and you can use uh, optical imagery and, or you can overlay both of them and, and select back, uh, the training areas accordingly. Right. Ideally, you'll use some reference data, some, some validated, as I mentioned, uh, uh, ground reference data. Does the accuracy vary if we select new polygons for accuracy assessments? Yeah, absolutely. So remember, we're running the accuracy assessments here based on the training data. Really what you want to do is you want to select an independent set of polygons and run the accuracy on those. Uh, I mean, that will give you a, a good, uh, uh, a, a much better characterization of your accuracy. So it is going to vary. It's going to be lower. Here, our accuracies were quite high. Um, but uh, for training data, it's, it's going to be lower. Here's a question, which band has greater penetration through the dense canopy? Uh, it'll be L-band. So L-band is available from 2006 through 2011. Uh, that's uh, global. There's global coverage of L-band data. You can download those images through the Alaska Satellite Facility. Are there other any alternatives besides this focal mean filter to reduce speckle and SAR data available in Google? Google Earth and India, there are some, there are other codes that have been written um, that apply other speckle filters. I'd be happy to share those with you if you send me an email. Okay. Um, Is the part of the code used for clipping the SAR data to optical data missing from the PDF? Oh, it might very well be missing from the PDF. So we will update that. Thank you for uh, making us aware of that. If we download SAR image and process that ArcGIS 
would there be a difference in accuracy or not? Um, I, it, I'm not sure I understand this question. You can download the SAR image and you can run all of this analysis. You can download the Landsat image, you can download the Sentinel image, um, and then you can do all of this in uh, ArcGIS. If you use the training data sets and if you use the same classifier, the accuracy should be the same. Okay, so we're up here at the top of the hour. Uh, just to, okay, so we will be getting to your questions, the ones that we weren't able to answer here because of lack of time. We will get to these questions on the Google Doc and we will post this Google Doc online in a couple of days, okay? Uh, so thank you thank you all very much for your interest for your enthusiasm for all the questions and stay tuned we have two more we have mapping mangroves on tuesday same time and then estimating forest height on thursday same time thursday tuesday and thursday of next week Wishing you all a great day, a, wait, a great weekend, and see you next week. And uh, one more thing, the homework, a lot of you have been asking about the homework. We will announce the homework at the end of the webinar. So at the end of that fourth uh, webinar, uh, next Thursday, we will be announcing the homework. There will be one homework only, and it will be based on all of the material covered and some of the demos. Stay tuned. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.